Uh, oh. Oops. Ooh. I thought I was doing the introduction, then I'm going to... Oh, yeah. This is Colin Young, in case you didn't know. Uh, but uh, we're very grateful to the uh, Sheffield Film Festival for um, doing this tribute to Colin Young. Um, and to Heather Crowell in particular for sort of organizing this and trying to organize four documentarians has been uh, almost as what much work as the rest of the festival. But um, we really wanted to uh, honor the, the work of Colin, not only in uh, setting up the National Film School, which is, is such a, a unique place. Um, I think he, he managed to uh, assemble an enormous amount of equipment and money and have a completely unstructured program so everybody could go off and make lots of mistakes and films. And he also pioneered um, a very particular approach to making documentaries, which I think, I hope, uh, we'll go into today, uh, which is very much going back to observational documentaries using real time, shooting in long takes, not filming with cutaways, not going in with that sort of structured approach of knowing what the end of the film is before you've started it. And I think at this particular time when television has kind of almost gone back into a very old-fashioned mode of making films, which is, you know, people pitching and they already know what the end of the film is. It's so contrary, I think, to the, what Colin was pioneering and the style, I think, which makes uh, documentary so special, which is it's about real people and it's about catching spontaneous things. So I'm going to leave you in the hands of Colin and thank you very much for coming. Well, the thing is, most of that is true. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to say that the group of people that you're going to be joining me with this afternoon and I have been working for the last, uh, well, several hours anyway, deciding what should happen today, and we still haven't decided. <laughs> but that's okay, because that's in the model of the National Film School. <laughs> the day before the school opened, I, I had already been able to hire maybe five or six people to work at the school. Uh, the rest had to follow. I had never worked professionally in the film industry in Britain, so I was a real novice. The only quality I had for the job was that I'd been running a very good film school in California called UCLA. And they plucked me from that, deposited me in a, in a country which was then suddenly run by a conservative government, although the project that I was set to direct had been created by a Labour government. So when I left UCLA, I remember the farewell speech from one of my colleagues there was, with his usual immaculate sense of timing, <laughs> Colin is leaving us to go back to Britain. And it was a disaster, because the Conservative government had no connection with the project. They didn't even think very highly of it, it turned out. And I was really surprised to find that neither did a whole lot of people in the film industry in Britain have a very high opinion of it. They couldn't imagine what you could possibly learn in a film school. They had no idea that it was possible to learn something in a film school. So what the hell had I left California for? I had a good job. The weather was good. Why was I in England? So I found it rather difficult to recruit people to teach in the school. There was nobody else I could find at that time except people already in other, the other two or three schools that existed, the one at the London Film School, the one at the RCA, who had any experience of teaching at all. And I thought I didn't want to take any of them because they were, I knew enough about these institutions that if you took a good person away, the place would collapse. So I didn't hire any of them. Also, I didn't import anybody because I had never worked professionally here. I didn't want anybody to prevent me from learning what it was like to be here. I didn't want to bring my California prejudices with me, I thought. But once I got to work, I brought a lot of them with me. But in that first uh, day or two before the school opened, 
those people I had managed to engage to teach I came to my house to dinner in Primrose Hill. And we had one of these wonderful white habitat tables. We sat around the table having a very nice dinner with a lot of liquid and uh, decided that night at dinner what, how we would open the school, with what curriculum we would open the school the next day. <laughs> they didn't think it was possible. So I, uh, as the dinner went on, I said, well, look, let's just decide what we're going to do in the first week. <laughs> and on Friday, we'll meet again <laughs> and see how that went. <laughs> and we'll have lots of feedback from the students. There were just 10 of them, 15 of them, 15 of them. Nick was one. Um, let's just see how it goes, and then we'll prepare the next week. And that's how it went on, week after week after week, learning on the job, until we became a place that people actually wanted to teach in. And one of them is here, Charles Stewart, master cameraman, who joined me a short time after the school opened. It was very touch and go whether the thing would work or not. I remember even the first graduation show we had at the National Film Theatre. The governors of the school, who were my supporters, could not make her a tale of the programme <laughs> because the films were so bloody good. How was that possible? In three years, because they kept on talking about, Colin, we don't really expect too much. We don't want to put pressure on you. Just think of it as nursery slopes, which I learned was a BBC expression. They liked people to learn on the nursery slopes before they made real programmes. A number of the people in that graduation group who became rather quickly well-established in British television were already way ahead of that. And they couldn't understand quite how it had got from that ramshackle be beginning that I've just described to you to what was on the screen. It didn't make any sense to them. That created a second problem, which was that, that you remember we used to have a trade union in the film industry called the ACTT. They were suddenly very surprised about this. And then you, I discovered I had a new enemy, the enemy of protected employment, where for the, I think the first four or five years later, I had to appear at the annual conference of the ACTT to fight off uh, various mo motions that were being introduced by the people I called the deaf sound recorders, the blind cameramen, <laughs> and the paraplegic editors, who wanted to put brakes on the entry into the industry of the people we had just finished training. It was an extraordinary thing to discover, because the ACTT officially had been a huge supporter of the creation of the school. But as they saw what was coming out, we were, we were in some senses a threat to the establishment. Now, I, I, as an educator, I understood that because probably the people who were most worried about us were people who had never had the chance to have the training that these people had. So there was, it, was a, it wasn't a level playing field. So entering the industry was not easy for the, uh, the graduates. And also it coincided with the five, the, what is it, the, the three day week. When television went off the air at 10 o'clock, and there was no electricity to run the television or something like that, I can't remember. Why was that, Charles? <laughs> Why did it go off? Minus at, minus what? Minus. What? The first minus strike. A strike? Yes. Minus strike. Minus. Okay. So, it, you know, you, no, no matter how much, <laughs> no matter how much you plan, and, and as you clearly see, I had not planned very well, uh, you, you, you put graduates out into a, a three-day week and say, bye-bye. If we had not prepared them correctly, they would have died at the gate. But the thing that we had not prepared them to be was employees. We had prepared them to be employers. Well, that's to say, people who could create their own employment, not to be dependent on other people, to employ them. 
So a surprising number of them survived, and not only survived, but accelerated into the industry. Not without opposition, not with wonderful welcomes. That came later. It, I have to say it took quite a while before the school had any kind of reputation that I could say I could be proud of. Because we really were learning on the job. And one of the reasons for that, although I was a professor from the University of California, boom, 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 I did not want to repeat what had happened there because it was a different culture, a different paymaster, different industry to go into. The only thing it had in common was that the industry in, Ca in California at the time was also against film schools. Until somebody came out called Coppola from UCLA, someone came out called George Lucas from the University of Southern California, somebody called Martin Scorsese came out of the New York University Film School, then suddenly we were pucker. But that was years after these schools started. So I knew that it would take time. And we had to act as if this was going to be all right. The first um, sign I got that we, there might be trouble was when I found myself actually, although I was welcomed officially by the BBC, I was much, felt much more at home with the people in Granada television. They knew a lot of the same people I knew in America. And they were curious about what my American experience had been. The BBC wasn't curious at all. I remember I was invited to lunch at Television Centre, that place on the top floor, the building that's about to come down, I believe, to, uh, by Hugh Weldon, who was one of my founding governors, and asked to talk about my American experience. I think I, when I could have talked to them for hours on end about my American experience, I think I only got about three or four minutes before they interrupted me and said, yes, 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 Colin, we know all about that. Because I was trying to talk about public service broadcasting, which didn't exist in America, nearly to the same extent that it does in Britain. But they said, you don't have to tell us about public service broadcasting. We are public service broadcasting. And, that was, and then I said, well, what did we talk about for the rest of lunch? <laughs> and that had to be my approach throughout. When, when the minister who had, was responsible for me asked me to come and see him and t told me that he thought the project was not very interesting and was bound to fail, I felt it my duty to tell him that I had a three-year contract. <laughs> but that that's really all he was bound to. He could just pay me the, the money. I, I the stop the, the ship container that was coming over the Atlantic at that moment with all my worldly possessions. Tell my family to stay in California. I had a tenure appointment to go back to, no problem. I would relieve them of the embarrassment. He said, well, that's taken five minutes. You've only got 25 minutes left. So I said to him, well, what do we talk about now? Always, always the question, was, it's a Scottish trick if you asked a question to ask the question back. And this is why I thought Nick was from Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Nick had the habit of turning up at my house in Hampstead just before dinner time. <laughs> we never had dinner at the same time every night because we were very rushed and disorganized. He wasn't a student yet, but he knew where to get a free dinner. <laughs> and I've been eating off him for the rest of the time since then. I think we better start talking about something else. Nick, why don't you come up for a minute? No, no, I don't want you to come. I want Joan to come up here. Joan Churchill, ladies and gentlemen. Jordan was my student in California and became one of my closest friends. But, so I, I think I can rely on her, but I'm not sure. She knows far more than I do about what I used to do in California. Her memory is not exactly correct, but it's, it'll do for today. 
But I wanted to show you right off something that she did uh, recently uh, in California with Haskell Wexler and Don Pennebaker. These are two people who became very important in my life and in the life of the film school at UCLA. Do you like to say what that was about? That dinner with Haskell, it's called. Do I press? Do I press? Do I press? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was just uh, because we were all in the same town making films together and apart, and we had cameras out and we'd all been out shooting and we came back it was dinner time and Penny's wife Chris is picking up a camera and I had a camera and we just started shooting the conversation because Penny and and Haskell hadn't really ever really talked and it turned into a three hour evening and uh, this is just a little clip of clip it, of it. You know, primitive people, a lot of people say that don't take my picture, you're stealing. No, you're stealing my You're stealing. Soul. You're stealing. In a right, sense, that's right. when you're, take, you're taking pictures, and when you're taking pictures, it gives you a control. Yes, but Joan, suppose you wanted to ultimately take what you shot here tonight and make it into a, a little film. Just that's that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Oh, okay. So then they control you. Now, Joan, and then, and then after you're cutting the film and so forth, you'll you'll say uh, to me, Haskell, I'm who visited you. Haskell, do you still have that that blue shirt that you wore? See, Wait a second. That. Let me ask you a question. And because you feel that your thing that you shot, if you had a scene of me coming through that door scratching my balls or something, you know, would you think that that would really give a, a, a profound meaning, a meaning to this film that you shot six months before? You wouldn't ask me to do it? Absolutely. Would not. I would. Never. I would. And it's an undertaking I, would, I give to everybody. Because it's just another piece of artifice that you've done, just as, just as you've decided what focal length to be on at this but very moment. But it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant, ask. Because it wasn't part of the situation, it's irrelevant. I mean, I think the editing you do want to control, but I don't think you want to adorn. But, 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 the, but the situation is the film. If the situation ceases to be... No, the situation is people sitting around a table. Bullshit. No. I think that the character of the discussion now would not have the... Maybe the exact words would be, it wouldn't have the meter, it wouldn't have the, maybe the concentration, which a relaxed three or four of us, or how many, were just sitting here uh, more tired than we may be acting, like I started very early this morning. Therefore, I'm speaking to you in an animated, younger than 85-year-old manner because I don't want to be perceived as an old fucking cameraman. <laughs> What's reality? I, well, there's something that I, not, I don't... You know, the way I solve the problem that you think I'm looking at this as, as movie maker, the way I solve the problem is I don't think at all. And that sounds, no, that sounds crazy, but when I get in, into the camera, I don't think. I'm like a cat watching a room full of people. I don't, and, and when people say, well, how do you decide? I don't decide anything. I'm in there floating in that camera, just watching what goes on. And I, sometimes I feel a little guilty that I don't take responsibility. It's like the painter who doesn't look at the canvas when he paints. It's, but it has a lot of that, but I think, I, I think that that's the way I protect myself from some aspect of what you're talking about, which is controlling. The thing about, about that, that's Pennebaker, Don Pennebaker, Monty Ray Pop and blah, 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 everything like that. He, in another film that was made recently, 
that Sean, you sent me, Sean McAllister, uh, he talks about the difference between controlling and chance. And s some people think that in fiction filmmaking, you have to have the control of everything that's happening. Not, not John Cassavetes, but most directors want that kind of control. Whereas what the do kind of documentaries that, that I was interested in, and that I was supporting at, at the film school, both in California and in England, was the, the opportunity to train filmmakers to make films out of chances, not controlling what they're looking at, never asking people to do the same thing again, never asking them to move from one place to another, never asking them to wear a particular kind of dress or coat or whatever, never asking them to do anything, but just keeping out of the way and keeping up with them and giving them the idea that they are, that they are in control of the film and not the people behind the camera. So people like Pennebecker, who made a life of learning how to do this, were certainly one of my inspirations. Leacock, who he worked with, um, Albert Maisels, who was here last year. These were all people who were, were learning how to, how to keep up with what it was they were filming and how to use what they were filming in a way which was transparent to the audience. They were the communicators between the subject and, and the audience. And uh, we were talking last night, some of us, about what that really involves. And it involves, Kim will explain that when she's here, uh, learning how to shoot a scene. Not just how to shoot bits and pieces that will be cut together later, but learning how to look at something so that it can be presented like that to an audience, without the interference of the editor, without the interference of somebody writing narration to explain it, but something which revealed itself to the audience in the same way that it revealed it to the filmmaker. Where, and it doesn't mean the filmmaker's not there, it just means the filmmaker's not controlling what is there. And that's quite different, because the classical documentary my countryman, John Grierson, would be dying if he heard me say this, because he wanted to be in control, because he had something he wanted to say, and people were used to say that. That's not what these people were doing that, that I was training. They were there to find out what other people thought about their reality, not what they themselves thought about those people's reality. So when the school started, I knew I had to have some allies to do this. And Joan had become, I thought, just one of these naturally gifted filmmakers. And that I was just lucky to be around when she was available to be trained. Uh, this is the thing that, that is sometimes misunderstood. That I was not training anybody. I was putting them in a position where they learned things which is a completely different way of looking at things. By the way, the film school, no, I won't leap ahead to that. In, in California, Joan could shoot all day long with an, a 16 millimeter camera on her shoulder and move it as if she was moving a gate that was opening on an oiled hinge. But I don't think anybody could do that anymore. The smaller camera, cameras are, are a real revolution. That's right. And completely changes how you interact with people and well, certainly what, the, what you can when, get. When I talk about my countryman, John Grierson, the cameras they were using then you could not lift up very easily. And you couldn't take them anywhere to shoot and you couldn't do sink sand with them. Well, either you could carry them or you could do sink sand, but you couldn't do both. But the, the cameras that Joan was able to start training with at UCLA, the Eclair, the NPR, so-called 60 millimeter and the, that all these people were using with, at Beaconsfield. That, that changed the way in which a documentary filmmaker could think about working. He didn't have to stop the world to get the photograph. He didn't have to ask the world to do anything other than what it was doing anyway, to get a scene that would work. However, there is a film language involved in all this, which is not transparent, right up front. If you get one of these little flip cameras now uh, because you can get anything you like with it, it doesn't mean you know how to make a scene. 
How many people here are filmmakers? Could you hold up your hands? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> One or two of my former students have to, didn't put their hands up. <laughs> okay, well, look, quite a few of you know what I'm talking about, but they, the, thing, the thing about looking at the world, the world is bloody complicated. How do, you, how do you put that camera between yourself and that in such a way that you reveal something to an audience, which is the same as they are revealing something to you? That is a linguistic problem, the language of film. It's not the language of poetry or the language of writing an essay or a piece of journalism. It's the language of film, of images and sounds that go together in a particular way. And that's what they all manage to learn both at UCLA and at Beaconsfield. Now, why did you team up with this guy? My pusher. He's my pusher this morning. Why don't come you on, come Nick. up here and we could talk about it. We were both shooters when we met. We were, yeah, we were. I actually, I've got mine here. Well, um, why did you team up with him? Well, I why mean, did I team up with him? Filmmaking wise. <laughs> I, mean, I won't go into the, the rest is hidden. Well, he was making um, a film about a rent strike, okay. and uh, I got a little bit involved in it. And he was just finishing, and he was about to graduate. And uh, it, it was I got hauled off to Kirby, and it was quite an amazing experience. And um, well, we probably didn't really work together until Juvenile Liaison. And, and I, just to pick up no, on what you... No, just stay with Rinsfrey. Right. But well, I actually wanted to talk about the shooting. You oh, were yeah. talking about the camera and okay. so on. And I just wanted to say about that, that it's the hardest possible kind of shooting, I think. And people underestimate it. And I think when you watch the footage of someone like Charles Stewart or Joan Churchill or indeed Penny Baker, you see somebody, or Kim, you see somebody who can paint a scene, and they aren't necessarily on the person who's talking. Sometimes they're on the person who's reacting. And they have a way of showing that scene that really means something to an audience. And they also have the technical competence to do it. So they hit focus. They can do it in a fluid way. And to come back to Renstrike, I really was, didn't have that competence. I was able to kind of stand back and and then when I go in, I'll generally be out of focus. I mean, it was a, Ren Strike's an interesting film, but a lot of it I noticed when I showed it the other day was uh, sadly out of focus. <laughs> so when I... Uh, that was the projector, Nick. I, I, of course, blamed it onto the camera. But then, of course, when I started working with Joan, it was incredibly liberating. I had to give up being on the camera. But it meant I could make a much more complicated film. So but Ren Strike was much more of a sort of conceptual film than the, c the kinds of films that I think you were really pioneering, which was more the anthropological films that Charles did and, and which Joan was doing. Well, I, th I think what, what, what I'd become interested in almost by accident in California was the way that film was evidence. What, 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 what was film evidence of? And who was, who was going to tell me the answer to that question? And I worked with a whole, whole lot of social scientists, particularly anthropologists. And Joan had come into that program uh, that I set up to, where filmmakers and anthropologists made films together. But what I, what I uh, also had to deal with was, the, was a series of questions. Not only what I've been talking about, which is how do you uh, act as a bridge between what you see and the audience. What kind of film language do you use? But also, what was the difference between that and fiction? Uh, fiction the, has a number of different styles, one of which is realism. And at its most extreme, that could be something like Les Blair or um, Mike Lee or John Cassavetes. What's the difference between that and a documentary? That puzzled me a lot. And I, I was a philosophy graduate from St. Andrews. So I had a great 
theoretical interest in that question. And I found that the anthropologists could help me uh, deal with it. However, they thought that film would be useful for them because all their field notes were very subjective and they wanted to be rescued from their own subjectivity and they were grabbing film to be objective. So one of the first things I had to do with them was to persuade them that film was not objective, that film was subjective, whether it was fiction or documentary. It was always somebody's point of view. It was never the truth. Now, the truth is in your bags, apparently. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it was not in our films. We were simply looking at something from our points of view, varied points of view. We preferred, for, ex for example, in this school of filmmaking, never to have more than one camera because we wanted to focus not only the, the filmmaker's attention on the single point of view, but also to focus the audience's attention on a single point of view, to accept it as subjective. Now, since it was subjective, how do you make the audience believe you? And so these things all get tied together because the way to carry an audience with you is not to keep on intercutting and moving the place around, but to stay with one thing and to stay with it until it's understood and as you can taste it almost, you can smell it, then you can move on to the next part of that. Where does that lead you? Having done that, what do I now have to look at? To see, to hear, to explain, to put that in context. So that kind of rolling inquiry was a little bit like um, climbing hills in Scotland called the Monroes. You got to the top of one and then you could see another, and then you could see another, and you could see another. You looked and you saw and you learned from what you had seen and heard and moved on. Where did it take you? You had no idea where it was going to take you. You let the camera take you. You didn't let your head take you. You had to go with the flow. If I had thought about it in time, I don't know how many of you have read any philosophy, but there was a wonderful Greek philosopher called Heraclitus who said you could never put your foot in the same river twice. I really meant to put that over the front door of the film school. Because <laughs> the reason you could never put your foot in the same river twice is it's never the same foot. And it's never the same river. So forget it. Now, if all documentary filmmakers had that blazoned in their heart, they would never ask anybody to do anything again. Go with what you got. If it's, if it's not clear, it'll happen. Something like that will happen again later and you'll be on your toes, and you'll see it this time. Now, that, at that time, in British television, was not the standard way of looking at documentary. And certainly one thing you should never do, and this was talking about the early 70s, the filmmaker should never appear in the film, should never make him or herself more important than the subject. Now, a, a lot of people know that Nick started putting himself in front of the camera with a film called Driving Me Crazy, which showed up again in The Leader, The, the, the Driver and The Driver's Wife. The Driver, Wife. yeah. Eh? Le yeah, yeah. Yeah. Long title. Yeah, long title. Um, that wasn't the first time he put himself into a film. It was in his graduation film, Behind the Red Strike. And we'd just like to put the, the very end of that film on. Because there was a woman that, that he stayed with while shooting that film called Ethel, who was, was and is well, probably his first major critic and certainly one of his most valued friends. <laughs> so this is Ethel. I don't, she's not on the screen, she's just voice. She's on the screen. She's on the screen. On the but screen. it came out very much out of Colin's questions about, you know, what is the role of the filmmaker Obviously, you're not invisible. That there is a relationship between the person behind the camera and the person in front of the camera. And it was like breaking... You were always talking about breaking through the wall. Yeah. And a recognition of that relationship. So, uh, you know, and uh, when I stayed with Ethel, she'd always have lots of arguments with me. She'd regarded me as a sort of uh, privileged, middle-class, you know... Twit. Yeah, a bit of a twit. Certainly un 
uneducated in what was really happening in Liverpool. So she saw it to herself to educate me, but in a rather slightly condescending manner. Um, at the same time, she put me up and tolerated me and, and found it all rather amusing, if not a waste of, t you know, I was a bit of a waste of time. So this was just her, you know, I was doing a film about their rent strike. Well, what do you think of me making a film down here? Well, I don't think anything about it. You can come in, you'll make it, and it'll have no effect. Like I've just said, it'll make people think for a few minutes, and that's all. But the position of the working class won't change. It won't change by you making a film, or for that matter, any other day. Filmmaker coming in, it just won't make any difference. There's been dozens of filmmakers we've seen on local estates and... Why do you think I'm making it then? I'm asking you that, why are you making it? It's only personal self-satisfaction, that's all that it must be. <laughs> the, the, the fact is that that question, why are you making the film, has run all the way through the films that I've had anything to do with. And as you'll see, if they don't throw us out before we get to that point, it'll be true of the people who joined me up here. Um, these two people started making films together and the whole, the whole rest of this week could be about that relationship and, and, what, and their journey. But we don't have the time for that. So what I think I have to do now actually, is ask Kim to come up. Can we, can we leave? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't go. <laughs> Kim Lodgerlotto. Hi. <laughs> because, because the question that Ethel asked there was, what, this film won't make any difference. People will think about it for a few minutes. The film that Kim made at her old school uh, Charles Stewart was her mentor at the time. Uh, was a, was I don't I don't think she set out um, to do anything other than have a kind of revenge. Is that, <laughs> is that fair to say? I think it was part of it. I think the other part was very much like what Karen was doing with the betrayal, which is a film that's just come out of the film school that I completely love, which is to go back to visit something that was very painful yeah. and actually. Um, get something out of it for yourself as well, if I'm being honest. I, because when I was there, I thought I was weird and everyone else was fine. And then when I realised making the film and people laughed at the film, I realised that actually we were all quite weird. And I think it's a similar thing of what Karen's doing, is, is going back to something. And what you said about being subjective, what I also love about Karen's film is that you're in it with her. And when I was making the film, I was very much filming it as a girl. I wasn't filming it as a teacher or trying to do an objective thing. I was trying to experience something again for myself. So it's what Ethel says to Nick. In, in a way, filmmaking, if we're being honest, it's a lot about what we get out of it as well. Mm. You know, us exploring the world for, for ourselves it, uh, mm. with, you know, with a curiosity. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Because what I remember, uh, Charles, you probably remember this too, the school that that, um, that, that Kim was filming in, um, they demanded to see the film before it was shown to anybody else. And we had a screening for that, that committee at the, at the film school. And they were, you could see that they were, they found it very un unsettling. But I wasn't sure quite how to interpret that. The headmistress in that school was you're going to see the clip, and then I'll explain what, what I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. All that we ought to have thought and have not thought. All that we ought to have said and have not said. All that we ought to have done and have not done. 
all that we ought not to have thought and yet have thought all that we ought not to have spoken and yet have spoken all that we ought not to have done and yet have done for thoughts words and works pray we O God for forgiveness and repent with penance has anyone in the school seen Debeline's blazer Would you all please go and get your blazers and check that you have your own blazer on. Debbie's blazer is marked. She rather stupidly left it lying in the French room and she hasn't seen it for a week. Some time ago I had occasion to talk to you about borrowing other people's property and wearing other people's clothes. I would like to point out that this applies to all clothes. Nobody is to wear anything belonging to anybody else. From now on I'm going to do spot checks and I shall examine the uniform that you're wearing. Now this is one of the reasons why and the documentaries coming out of Beckettsville at that time were somehow linked with Ealing comedies <laughs> <laughs> rather than with social realism. But, uh, this woman in, in, the, in that film revealed things about herself which the governors of her school did not know about her. And that was what was unsettling to the committee who came to look at the film, they suddenly saw the school that they didn't know existed. They thought the school was something else than that. Now, one of the, one of the effects of that was the headmistress was fired, which is not bad for revenge. <laughs> uh, the man who was then the, the secretary to the Journal Advisory Council of the BBC who was the chairman of that school, resigned. I was a member of that advisory council. So I had, had funny mixed relationships with him. The school uh, was closed, was sold, the property was sold to Hammer Films Productions <laughs> as a set <laughs> for horror films. <laughs> <laughs> was a victim of either an accident or arson, I never knew which, was burned to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad for the first documentary out of the film school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, as I say, I was a member of the advisory council for, the, for the, the BBC at the time. I was also chairman of the Edinburgh Film Festival, and they begged me not to show the film in Edinburgh. They even got an injunction preventing the film being shown in Edinburgh. But an English injunction doesn't work in Scotland. <laughs> I knew that, but they didn't. So we showed the film there, and it was, it was hailed as a comedy when it was shown in the London Film Festival. Now, I, I wish all of Kim's films were comedies after that, but they, they're, they're not. But what... What she has dedicated herself to, somehow or other, I don't know how this all came about, she's dedicated herself to filming people in, at peril. And, and, and I don't know, well, you don't ever say you expect the world to change as a result of your films, but you go on showing us these things about ourselves that are not right. So what's your motivation? Um, I think it's like what we were saying before, I think it's like to explore things, because I think you get an awful lot out of it as well. And, um, and I think also just to be a witness to things. I don't really have... I think that's truthful. Yeah. But so what, how would you explain 
the way you go about doing that in relationship to what we've been talking about? Um, I think what was different with um, what when Haskell said that thing about asking people to put a different jacket on or a different, you yeah. know, I would never do that. Yeah. In fact, Joan was my, um, she, I was very insecure when I was at the film school and she was my teacher. So she was, um, you were really kind to me. <laughs> anyway, and, um, and also the other thing when Heskel, the other guy says, Penny Baker says about not thinking, uh, we're all different, you know, I remember when I was thinking, I am always thinking, but I'm usually, like in that clip there, I'm very much hiding behind the girls so that the, the teacher doesn't see I'm filming and then I go out and film her. So I'm usually very much feeling lots of things and also thinking, thinking I need a close-up of her because if I'm filming her from back, she's going to be wobbly. And so I'm always thinking, actually. I would never say I'm not thinking. Look, I think Penny Baker's always thinking. But yeah. I don't think he's thinking in terms of shots. I, I always am, yeah. yeah. I'm not obviously not as instinctive and intuitive as he is. Yeah. But you're a much better shooter. <laughs> oh, Molly. thank you. <laughs> Molly, get up here. Molly Dineen. Hello. Hello, Colin. Do we have, what do we have of you today? Oops. What do we have? Home from the Hill. Home from the Hill. Mm. Molly came to us because she was somebody's girlfriend. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> that is why I got in. <laughs> Somebody called Harry Hook. And Harry Hook. Um, That's me dead in the water. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, Molly had been a student at the London College of Printing. Is that right? But not directly before. I'd been a I was on an ACTT thing That's right. because to get a union ticket, it was a closed shop, and I was working with a camera crew. Yeah. So that's where I was imprisoned. And you you showed a film in your application, which I thought was terrible. Yes, you told you told everyone that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure I'm sure maybe Harry had something to do with your applying, but he had nothing to do with your selection. I was jealous because he was my boyfriend. I was working with a camera crew and he was at the film school yeah. being one of those... Because um, they were auteurs at the time. The film yeah. school had 24 yeah. auteurs, people who made films. When I got in, apart from the fact you wanted 50% women at the time. Did we? Which is why I got in, yes. The other thing <laughs> was that <laughs> it was the first year you, I think, had been maybe pressured but to ape the shape of the industry. You were having to produce technicians... So they'd said, you've got to stop producing filmmakers and you have cameramen, directors, script writers, producers. Remember, that was a stage. But the yeah. only people who were left alone to continue to be hippies were the documentary people, <laughs> which is why I ended up where I am there. <coughs> and actually, I, I think, um, because of the way I'd been trained, which was very conventional, you fragmented the action. So you were breaking things up into shots all the time, wide shot, close, reverse. You were shooting for an editor. And largely, the interesting conversations would be happening with the crew while they were setting up the shot, at which point you'd put the lit interviewee down who would then die and have nothing to say. And what really... I thought what you were wonderful at doing, as far as I was concerned, was completely liberating the way of telling stories. You made me realise that the interest is in that conversation that happens before you put the lights on. So what you do, and it's much harder work because you have to permanently, permanently be on the watch. And I agree with you, I'm always thinking shots and content, which is why it does your head in. But I thought um, the film school, actually, well, I would go so far as to say you gave me a language with which to, a way of looking at things, which hadn't ever, ever occurred to me. Okay. <clears throat> in fact, um, in... My philosophy studies, I learned there was no such thing as a fact. And I've just said, in fact, you see the contradictions. Oh. I, so I would not, I think I, I, there was a certain point where the, uh, the people trying to get away from facts called them factoids, like hemorrhoids, I guess. 
Because uh, when, <laughs> when I was on that BBC Advisory Council, there was a thing came out uh, as a result of research from the Glasgow University study on the news, where the BBC was taken to the cleaners for not being aware of how manipulative the news was at nine o'clock every night by the way they organized the program and what they left out and what, how they positioned stories in, in the lineup. They defended themselves in a very, I think, uh, kind of almost colonial way, not admitting that they, any of that was going on at all, because all they were presenting were the facts. And I pointed out to them that the most useful thing about the nine o'clock news was the clock that went on just before it. <laughs> Because when that hand went up like that, every, the whole country went like that to ch check their watches. <laughs> and I said, I think you think that that doesn't happen when the news comes on. But what about if, when the news comes on, and you, and you say something that the audience disagrees with, maybe they're going click, 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 click also, and changing that too. You have to be responsible for that. Do you know what they did? They took off the clock. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to sit next to Alan Plater in these meetings, and we'd grumble and uh, <laughs> write notes to each other all the way through the meetings. Um, and it was the secretary of that council who was the chairman of her school. So you can see my allegiances have been very conflicted and contradictory. Mm. What I think that Molly did was to present herself to her subjects in a way which made them forget the camera was between them. And so I would like to show you just the last clip from her film, Home from the Hill, which was where the boyfriend came in. Because it was her, his father <laughs> who was retiring from his t time in, uh, as a colonial officer somewhere in Africa, had been thrown out of his ranch by, what was he called? Uh, Mr. Mr. <laughs> the, the absentee landlord suddenly reclaimed the property. And, and Joan just had, Joan, Kim, Molly, <laughs> <laughs> Alice, <laughs> Sean, just happened to, <laughs> happened to be there when this Mr. Mugo came to claim his property. <laughs> Uh, so he came, Hillary Hook came back to England and, and uh, Molly sh showed me the, the material she'd shot with him in Africa and it was decided that she would make a film about Hillary's return to England and, and what that was like and that became Home from the Hill. I'd like to show you just the last scene in the film. What's it called? Um... Willow herb, isn't it? Woof, it's cold. Come on, let's get out. Go to a pub. I rose politely in the club. It isn't true to say I swore, rushed about the room and roared. I rose politely in the club. I said, I feel a little bored. Will someone take me to a pub? I want to ask you an embarrassing question, Hilary. Yes, you get an embarrassing answer, too. I want to ask you if you're basically happy. Oh, blissfully happy in your presence. Otherwise, I represent divine discontent. Well, that was the relationship that Molly was doomed to have with all her subjects. And it's something that informed her career and a whole lot of other people's, because there was something that you made the camera disappear. Yes, but that was only because of the sort of aggressive line of teaching, which is that you were absolutely clear about never hiding yourself or your relationship, which had never occurred to me. Yeah. So I think that was a very, very strong... I mean, that film was made, really, by teaching in the cutting room. That happened over a year, didn't yeah. it, in the film school? Yeah. And Herb de Joya? Yeah. Herb de Joya was one of my former students from UCLA 
who I brought over. I think the school was well enough established to start dealing in imports. And he was one of my first imports. And he, he ran the documentary department for a long time until it became quite clear that he was such an enemy of television that he was damaging the school's re industrial relations. <laughs> he was sent back to America. And that guy, Dick Fontaine, was hired in his place. Because he was, he was, he wasn't, I don't know, you were kind of uh, a spy inside British television, Dick. There were a few around it. Yeah, a guerrilla warfare. Well, I, I, I mean, the, again, because of the shortage of time, there's so many things that, that Molly w went on to do with the films that she made that just uh, revealed how, what a wonderful path we were on, that we had not only the right students, but we had the right tools. And the things were really beginning to, to, to sing. So much so that uh, I want to show you the very last scene in a film that she made called The Lie of the Land. I don't know whether you can. Oh. Okay. Right. Okay. We can't do that. I want, what I would have shown you in The Lie of the Land is the film about started out being about fox hunting. Why don't you say what that was? Um, I, well, or what about, rather than that? We you can do Lie of the Land. <laughs> what? We can do Lie of the Land. Okay. Right. We can do it. Right. Molly set out to make a film about fox hunting. We, but it became something else. And this, this was the farm of one of the people that she was following. What was his name? He's a farmer in Chipping Norton called Lynn Pearman. That's Hold it! Hold it! Hop! Hop! Hold on it! Hold on it! Can't get out there, girls. The gate's over there. That's quite impressive, Glenn. Are you surprised? What? Are they coming like that? Why shouldn't they? They're my little dears. Yeah, but you're normally chasing them and beating yeah, them. Yeah, the but they'll still come. They know I'm not chasing them today. I don't. They shouldn't be able to get through there. Yeah, they'll have to go back up and out of that gate. If they really love me, they'll go back up and out of there. Come on, old gal. Oh, what a lovely sight. Come on! Help! Oh, they missed me! Come on! Help! Come on! Hold that! Come on! Help! Help! Hold that! Come on, Ed! Help! Hold on, gal. Now, you see two things in that sequence. One is his relationship to the sheep, and the other is Molly's relationship to him. Cows. Your cows. Cows, cows, cows. Thank you. Very cows, good. cows. But I, can I say something? Which Please. is that I think that's entirely... Because it makes me think nothing's changed, really, in 25 years. It's almost the same thing as with Hillary. <laughs> what you did and what the film school did, and particularly you and Herb, I think was, for me, was fuse you with the camera as a person so that you're, the protagonists are dealing with you as a person, not as a piece of equipment. So, mm -hmm. And I think that's a monumental step, which, tragically, um, television seems to be losing its grip of a bit because you were going to talk about the... Reality television. Well, I don't think there's time to talk about reality television. <laughs> but I have to say... Eh? Yeah. Come on, Sean. Come on, Sean. Yeah, because he fixed the script. In case you thought that the film school was dominated entirely by women, we, we took the occasional man in after Nick. <laughs> Hi, Sean. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. 
the, the reluctant revolutionary, Sean McAllister. <laughs> that being the case, Sean, why did you come to the film school? Because he, I think he came in just as I was leaving, so I'm not really... You I can't abandoned claim any me. Credit for him. I hey? came because of you, and you left as soon as I, I arrived. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'd gone to this other film school which was trying to teach, uh, I don't know, I mean I had the idea of film school and then I got into one and they were trying to sort of teach this very rigid way to make films and I suppose it's only when you're confronted with what you don't want that you realise that and uh, I kind of abandoned this school and went off to make this film in a factory where I was working and in my second year at this film school I just cut this thing together on a machine that Sony had uh, kindly donated for me to cut it on and it was at the advent of the small camera, they have bad, you know, sound, and I, the, 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 I proposed it as a film to the film school. They said, yeah, yeah, we'll take a jib and a crane and a dolly and all these different things. I said, no, that's ridiculous because everyone will, like, laugh at I've had worked there for a few years, you know. I said, the guys will laugh at us. I've got to go with a little camera. They said, you can't do that because filmmaking is all about collaboration. And so I opted out of the school program and... and and I worked, because I didn't have any money, I worked, I took the camera in and I found a way of making the film working and I discovered this intimacy and connection I had with the people. Anyway, this became my application film to okay. the film school and Herb DeJoy said, we felt sorry for you, so we let you in. <laughs> he didn't understand a word of it because it was all broad northern you know, accents, but I think he just felt sorry. T oh, tell me about uh, Syria. Why, why, why did you get involved in Syria? Well, um, after I left the film school, I went back on the dole, which is where I'd been before the film school. And um, <laughs> I'd started writing a lot of proposals to dickheads in television that didn't answer or read uh, any of them anywhere. And I realized that this wasn't going to really get me anywhere. And then one day someone said to me, do you want to go to Iraq? And I said, why not? And up until then, I'd had this idea of Iraq from the news. And I went for a month and uh, with my little camera, I was filming these little things, and I realized, wow, these guys are nothing like what I'd seen on the news. And it kind of became a little bit of a mission for me in Iraq. It was a love affair, really, because I, I really felt something from these people. And I pushed and pushed to try and get a film made in Iraq, my own film, and it was very difficult. And then in 1998, there was, they were about to attack and because of a connection I'd made with the Saddam's minders, these guys that look after you, I used to go drinking with them, and they were like my pals. I put in an application for a visa, and that was my commission. And, and, and you know, by that time, I'd taken all of the learnings from the school, and I could put it into this film, and it was a fantastic opportunity because, the, because I didn't need to put, give a proposal. The visa was the, the commission. And I made this film off, you know, with characters and, and, and it became a way of getting another commission without having to write all this baloney. So what was the first film you made in that process? Uh, it was a film back in Hull about a guy who'd never worked. I'd um, got a, uh, yeah, he'd, not, he'd worked about four weeks in his life and was politically opposed to working. But when did you make Liberace? Was that after that? Liberace Baghdad, well, that was in 2004, uh, because the first Iraq film was, did quite well for the BBC, so Nick Fraser said to me, I've got no money, but I'd love you to go back to Iraq. And I said, oh, fuck, it's looking quite dangerous. So I waited for a bit till what I thought was safe, and then I said, OK, we'll go back now, and it, it was like a bad, bad timing, because it, it got more dangerous. Um, <laughs> and um, at the time, he gave me some money to make a film about the trial of Saddam. But he said, we don't really want the trial of Saddam. We want you to just find something else. Um, and I called him up. I said, there's this pianist. He's, he's, he's like, uh, half his family's in America. And, you know, he was a big womanizer. Saddam was always chasing him. He was he was, and he said, that's great. Just make that film. Forget the trial of Saddam. <laughs> Colin. Yeah. Can I just, um I think it would be interesting if you said something about your views of reality TV, because I think more and more people are having to cater to those demands from television <coughs> and uh, work in a style which is kind of pretty much the opposite to what you've pioneered. Well, there was a, a um, panel discussion recently at BAFTA that Molly was part of on the effect on documentary of 
of the reality shows. Structured reality. Structured reality, mm -hmm. yeah. And there were people there who, uh, the only way is Essex, uh, Chelsea. Made in Chelsea. Made in Chelsea. <laughs> uh, who uh, represented one approach to television, into television entertainment. And Molly was in the high ground. And who was the other one that was there? What, what was interesting to me was that they, that Molly said the sort of things you would expect her to say. Uh, uh, I was stupefied. I was right in the front seat, front row in front of her. I could not think of what I could possibly say that was either not insulting nor brief <laughs> enough to be comprehensible. Because as, as Nick correctly pointed out in the program note for this festival, I tend to go on a bit. And I don't think I said that. No shaggy dog stories. Oh, shaggy dog. Well, you are. A yes. There was, <laughs> there was no time to go on a bit, so I said nothing. I was stum. However, what I noticed was that the people who were not making observational documentaries claimed that they did make them, yeah. and that's how they started out. And uh, they didn't find they worked terribly well in terms of entertainment. So they shifted onto a different kind of program making, which is called structured reality. Now, the, one of the media partners for this festival um, came up with this, uh, this magazine called the, the, the Reality Report. Did you get it in your, your bags? Um, they run uh, an mm. awards um, program. And in the non-fiction category, uh, they have very <coughs> sub-categories. Sub non-fiction best one-off, non-fiction with recreations, non-fiction without recreations, reality docu-format, reality docu-reality, <laughs> and reality docu-soap. Now, this is the world that I'm not familiar with. Um, many of their programs, I'm sure, are, have, have huge audiences, but I'm not among them. That doesn't mean to say that they're bad. It just means that it's a different way of looking at the uses of television. And my own view about television is that it should be useful to the society in which it's produced. That, in effect, that Film, people making films for television are missionaries for a better way of life. We know what it would be like, or we think we know what it would be like, to be living in a society where the states controlled everything that was on television. But what's interesting about our state is that we're not so aware of these state influences because we don't have, uh, what's it called, uh, dogma, we think. We don't have any kind of bias. And in fact, when Nick made his first film at the film school called uh, Proud to be British, it was shown in the local uh, cinema to an extremely puzzled audience <laughs> because they, they thought it was frightfully interesting. But why didn't you ever photograph the other side? It's not very fair to show only one side. So even people who were being attacked in that audience for their way of life and their kind of mainstream middle class ideology thought it was unfair to show only their side of the argument because there was another side. Now, we know there are far more than two sides. This is long before we had multicultural arguments in Britain. We always knew there was more than one side to a question. There were many, many sides to the question, to any question. And the notion that television does not have a mission to deal with that seems to me to be irresponsible. So I'm, I'm not saying that all reality television is irresponsible, but I think it simply would be a disaster if that took the time on the television screen away from 
the kind of documentary that I'm personally interested in. I think it would be a, a great loss. And I hope that many of you agree with that. You could applaud if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I want to make two other announcements. The first is that one of the great friends of documentary in Britain died recently and was buried yesterday. That was Di Vaughan. He was, uh, and I, because I'm with you lot, I couldn't be there. And I know that somebody who is there now, Andre Singer, from, the, from, from television, is there because he couldn't, he couldn't be here because he's there. Divon was a great friend of documentary, a wonderful writer, and I really advise you to look him up at Google and find out what he's written about documentary and take pleasure in, in being with him in that way. The other announcement is that the Student Awards this year. What's that, Charles? Sorry? I've got something that was written for the funeral yesterday. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. The other, the other thing I want to say is the student award this year was given to, of all things, a student from the National Film and Television School, who is here, Karen Vinter. <laughs> Kim referred to her earlier about going back to a place of pain, and Karen's place was a very complicated place of pain. Uh, it also got the prize in Amsterdam earlier at the, to the end of last year, so I hope that Sheffield was not just playing catch-up, but that it really was the best film in that oh, yes, group. It was. I'm so sure. I would just like to say, we've come to the end of this session. Got oh, we got ISIS. Right. Well, I've been given oh, signs ISIS. here. I, we, 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 we need ISIS. Right. We have to have ISIS. ISIS. <laughs> ISIS. ISIS. Ah. Please. <laughs> Heather, I tried. I tried. <laughs> You've heard of something called the kitchen sink. Well, several of them are here. <coughs> and this is one of the kitchen sinkers. Hi. Isis Thompson. Hello. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, well, kitchen sink. We, we are a collective of the eight uh, students from the docu documentary course that graduated last year. Um, and we basically... Uh, studied together for two years and sort of realised that we really like working with each other and supporting each other. So we um, we created this collective and we have screenings. We have a base in Clapham where we have regular monthly screenings. We've just um, organised a festival, the Bread and Roses uh, Film Festival and things like that. And we're just constantly sort of finding new ways of working together um, uh, three of us made our first feature together uh, last year, The Real Social Network, which we can't show a clip from. But, um, yeah, so um, we, we're just finding new ways of, um, of being together and supporting each other. Um, yeah. I'm so sorry we didn't have time for your clip. That's all right. Can't we show a clip of Social Network? Pardon? Can we show a clip? A clip? I, don't, I don't think there's time. We'll have time. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> you made a terrible it's a two mistake. Two-minute trailer. Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, as as they say, um, good night and good luck. <laughs> we are showing the clip. We are you showing the clip. Oh, you have it. Oh, okay. good. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> I'm the goat man, and I'm here to save education in the UK. I mean, we need something quicker than that, mate. That's the problem with unions, right? The turnaround's very, very slow. We need this as copy to The Guardian today by Ford. Yeah, my grandma made this for me to keep me safe from protests. I am the queen of Twitter. They decided not to regulate their bonuses. It's like they're just throwing our money into the banks who just take more for themselves after the party is over. Fuck that. We are winning, and we might have won that vote just then, but like that's not the end. Who's back, please? This is not gossip, this is us.
urgent. We're apparently going to have a kettle starting here now. We're busy. We're doing a press release anyway. An awesome press release. We can't allow them to push us around like this when we've actually got so much strength, which is why they're having to resort to these tactics. I think I probably need to keep a lower profile. to helicopter feeds from uh, news people. Like, we definitely hacked it. Politics is fucked up. I don't know what to think. What I do know is that every human being has the right to information. Basically, we made this application to uh, help you during the protests, keep safe, uh, keep mobile. It's that copper's money. It's the cameraman. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry if I've ruined your Sunday. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that lady there, Hilary Thomas. Hilary, stand up again. Hilary Thomas. <laughs> the the, reg the registrar the at the film school. Yeah. Just got an OBE. Whoa. And I'd like to thank Hulk. okay. I'd like to thank Heather so much, Heather Kroll of uh, Sheffield, organising this tribute, and to present Colin with this watch for his service to the documentary film industry. <laughs> From all of us. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.